Greetings, I'm Shad, and welcome to my review of the cities and or castle-like structures in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. In this video, we will be looking at the movie depictions of Edoras, Minas Tirith, and the Hornburg of Helm's Deep. Now, I love Lord of the Rings, okay? It's one of my favourite movie series, but I'm not going to let my love for this franchise affect my objectivity in my analysis. So without any more delays, let us begin. The first thing that stands out to me about Edoras is the size. It is about as big as a small medieval city, and that strikes me as odd, because Edoras is supposed to be the capital of Rohan. And as the capital, it is just nowhere near big enough, especially when we can try and extrapolate how big of an empire and population Rohan would have to have from the size of its army. In total, Rohan ends up having a pretty darn big military. And to build a military that big, you need a pretty darn big population. And the size of Edoras does not reflect the size that this nation's capital city should reflect. Now you might say the Rohimir are just spread out more, they don't consolidate all their numbers in one big location, and you know, that could be the case. It would be a bit different to what would naturally happen, because people are drawn to places of security, especially in dangerous, you know, uncertain times like any medieval-based period. And cities are convenient, they have many necessities and luxuries all contained in a close area. Being in an area of a larger population provides greater business opportunities because there's more people to sell goods or services to. And they would generally be more secure because they are protected by big walls. Now we will get to the walls of Edoras because they're a bit weird. But my point is that when you have a nation of a certain population, they will naturally have larger cities. And Edoras does not reflect this at all. The next really big odd thing about Edoras is that I have no idea how these people feed themselves. There, there is not a single bit of farmland anywhere. There's lots of land that's ready to be farmed, but no actual crops at all. And these people are supposed to be the horse masters. Okay, where are their fields of horses? At the moment, it just looks like Edoras is a small city just dumped in the middle of nowhere. Realistically, there should be far, far more signs of human cultivation. Okay, now to the city itself. It looks brilliant. This is such a beautiful, gorgeous depiction of a medieval fantasy-like city, clearly taking inspiration from Anglo-Saxon Norse kind of cultures. Everything looks very realistic in regards to that design style. Anglo-Saxon Norse, oh, just beautiful, abs pure realism right here. Absolute immersion, just beautiful. And then combining the horse theme all throughout their decorations. And look at the palace or the great hall, it is just gorgeous. And this is one of the things that I absolutely love about Lord of the Rings, their attention to the fine details is just amazing. But they have fallen short on some of the larger details, like the size of the city, farmland, and now let's look at the walls. Now the walls have a stone base with a timber palisade-like structure built atop it. Now there's nothing wrong with this actual design, in fact it looks pretty darn good for what it's trying to represent. What doesn't make sense here is that it feels very out of place with the technology level that's been established in the Lord of the Rings world, Middle Earth. We know humans have figured out how to work stone pretty darn well. Just look at Minas Tirith and we'll get there. But they know how to make really, really effective walls. And so it begs the question, why on earth would they have a crappy timber palisade when they could have built such better defences? They, The technology exists, alright? It's in the world. What, maybe the Rohimir just don't have that technology? Well, this is what would happen in real life. They would hire people from abroad, from Gondor and other places, to build the walls for them. That's what they would have done. Especially for the capital. I mean, my goodness, this is where the king lives. You see, that was actually a fairly common thing in the medieval period, when a new kind of architectural, you know, design or principle was developed and built on a castle and people saw, hey, that looks really good. Well, guess what they did? They hired those architects, moved them over to where, you know, they wanted to build their own castles and got them to build the castles for them because they know, well, those ones over there are a lot better. I want one like that because I want to protect myself to the very best technological level that has been achieved in our world. And 
And so these walls around Edoras really are out of place. They are so primitive compared to the other defensive structures we see in Middle-earth. Beautiful, gorgeous, just look at this city. I mean, again, attention to detail, amazing, but my first reactions to Minas Tirith is very much the same as my reactions to Edoras. The size of this city does not reflect the population that the nation of Gondor is supposed to have. It is the size of a small medieval city, maybe a little bit bigger than a small one, but it is nowhere near the size of what a capital medieval city would be. There should be another very wide, expansive, you know, wall that circles around what we see here all the way to where Gandalf is at about at the moment, and then I would say, you know, it's about as big as I would be happy with. But if they wanted to amp it up, because this is epic fantasy, they could have made it huge. And of course, the other absolute bizarre thing is, again, where on earth is the farmland? How are these people feeding themselves? These fields should look like a patchworked quilt of cultivated farmland. Now looking at the city's architecture, it is epic in scope in how it rises with the side of the mountain. And honestly, I think that could be achievable with medieval level technology. It would be a heck of a lot of work, but we see some just astounding feats of architecture in the medieval period and even a bit before it. I mean, look at the Colosseum. And so if a people really wanted to build a city like this, I, you know, think they could. It is profoundly impractical, okay? And why? Well, how difficult would it be to rise up to each new level? It would just be an absolute pain in the butt. Can you imagine if you lived on the second top level or even the third top level? Honey, I'm gonna go see Bob. Really? But you gotta walk half a mile of stairs just to get to him! Oh yeah, you're right. Nah, never mind, I'll just have a beer. I feel sorry for the king, who lives at the very top. He would either never leave there, because any time he would ever want to go anywhere in the city, he would have to trudge through so many steps. But he's the king. He'll probably just get people to carry him. But still, do you get what I'm saying? It's profoundly impractical, especially when you have to move goods and supplies and stuff like that. It would just be a nightmare. Now, there is a kind of, you know, close-ish comparison in the real world. It's nowhere near as, as extreme. That's kind of what I mean. This is a bit too extreme. But the close comparison is Mont Saint-Michel. The difference here is that it's not as tall as Minas Tirith, and that there's not as many levels. Also, Mont Saint-Michel was never considered a city. It's an island commune, which is roughly equivalent to a civil township. Still, there are a lot of comparisons you can make with Mont Saint-Michel and Minas Tirith. But if we were to compare them side by side, in my opinion, as I kind of look at it, the top of Mont Saint-Michel would reach about the very second or first level up from the ground level of Minas Tirith. Minas Tirith is way taller. So tall that, in my mind, it's impractical. Would I change it? You know, probably not, because this is fantasy. And it just looks awesome and epic. And it'll probably make more sense if there was a larger ground level where the regular commoner peasant folk would live. And then the rich who can pay for people to take them up and down and to have things lugged up and down, well, they can get people to do that for them. So the upper levels could be reserved for the noble elite and wealthy, where they can look down on those beneath them, socially and literally. Now, having said all that about the upper levels of Minas Tirith, there is a very, very significant advantage that could actually make it more plausible to actually have it on a city. And that is in defense. Having to climb long, narrow stairs to get to each successive level would make it such an absolute turd in trying to conquer the city. You see, there's no real walls to breach on this next level because the side of the mountain is the wall. You just have to go up to get to the next level of the city. And the access ways would be small, narrow stairs, which would be very easily defended. You would bottleneck any enemy that's trying to get up them. The levels are just way too high for a siege tower to even, you know, 
come close to reaching. Without the use of magic and other incredible things that, you know, could exist in a fantasy world, with standard medieval technology, I don't see any way how you could actually assault those upper levels. Now, there is duplicity, the standard Trojan horse kind of tactics, sneaking people in and other things like that, but I'm talking about in a standard assault. It would basically be impossible, and the only thing that you could do is to resort to a drawn-out siege where you would try and starve out the city. So in this sense, there is actually a bit of practicality to these upper levels. It would make daily living an absolute pain in the butt, but maybe the citizens are willing to go through the discomfort for the security. Now, looking at the outer walls of Minas Tirith, I just love it. Do you see all those machiculations? They look so awesome, and they're absolutely authentic. These are very legitimate defensive parts of the walls. Looking at the city's entrance, there isn't necessarily a gatehouse here per se, but the design of where this entrance is actually provides almost as much benefit as what a gatehouse would. What you'll notice, the entrance, the door, is actually recessed, okay, from the main outer line of where the wall is. And so the wall is traveling around, and when it reaches the part of where the door is, the walls move backwards a bit, creating kind of a, a, an alcove that you would have to walk through before you reach the door. This is a very solid tactical design. It means anyone who tries to assault this wall is just going to get absolutely pelted by those on the walls that are standing on either side. And that's exactly what we see in the Goblins and Orcs' first attempt in trying to take down this door. They get absolutely demolished. So yes, having the main gate of the city recessed a bit into the wall so there can be two side walls for anyone who's approaching it is a very solid bit of defensive architecture. But it really should have had a gatehouse there. You see, proper medieval defences rely upon redundancies. If the first line of defence fails, we want something, a backup, that would then enable us to try and fight them off. And a gatehouse is a classic example of that. Not all gatehouses had this, but many had double doors. Once you burst through the first door and portcullis that was covering it, guess what? You had to enter this building, which is like a, a tunnel, where at the end of it, to leave the gatehouse, is another door and another portcullis trapping the people inside, and they would then have to deal with murder holes or arrow slits on either side, where they would just get slaughtered. It would be a death trap. Again, layers of defense. But we don't see this in the movie. As soon as the bad guys break through the first door, there's nothing else. They're they are in the city now, and it's, re it's chaos in the streets. Where, if they were employing proper principles of medieval defense, there would have been a gatehouse behind this first primary door that would have trapped the attackers in once they broke through it. The last thing that I find interesting are the tribuches that are assembled along the walls of the city. Now, I've never actually seen any historical cases of tribuches, catapults, or other siege-like equipment being set up on top of medieval walls. And, you know, I've done a fair bit of research, and again, not once has that ever been a topic of conversation or something that has been pointed out. The main reason why why? Well, I don't think there was any room on the ramparts of the wall to fit tribuches or other siege-like equipment, and even on the towers. It's rare that you would find a tower large enough to be able to fit a tribuche on it. But okay, what if there was? What if you could, there was enough room, or even you built enough room to set up a tribuche? Would that be practical or useful? No. Because if they ever really did want to set up a trebuchet to fire back at an attacking enemy that's assaulting your castle, you would set it up behind the wall. Lots of advantages in doing that. One, you're being protected by the wall itself, which would make it much, much harder for the enemy siege equipment to take out your trebuchet. Also, depending on the size of the trebuchet, putting it behind your wall might actually shield it from sight of the enemy, making it much harder for the enemy to use their own large rock-throwing devices to launch boulders at your trebuchet and destroy it. So yeah, it probably would have been a better idea in Lord of the Rings for them to have set up their trebuchets behind the outer wall. So there you go, those are my thoughts on Minas Tirith. 
often misidentified as Helm's Deep, the Hornburg, which is located within the Valley of Helm's Deep, looks to be a fairly solid looking fortress. Now, is it a castle? Well, it kind of depends on how you define the word castle. I've done a whole video on that subject. Because the Hornburg is a fortress that uses medieval style battlements, you can rightly call this a castle, though generally most castles would have served as a place of governance and also a residence for uh, the family that owned it. And because of that, I actually think it's more accurate to call this structure a fortress instead of a castle. The Hornburg was built to defend the entrance to the Glittering Caves. I don't know much about the Glittering Caves, but they must be strategically important, hence the need of the fortress itself. The small valley itself that sits in front of the entrance to the Glittering Caves and to the side of the main fortress part of the Hornburg is called the Deep, and the wall that blocks off access to the Deep and the Glittering Caves is the Deeping Wall. Now, the wall has a barrier to prevent people from falling off, and there looks to be kind of arrow slits at intermediate intervals, kind of making crenelles, and therefore the crenellations that are classically found on castles. The problem is, that barrier only comes up to about chest height, and doesn't offer nearly as much protection as it should. The merlons in crenellations, which is the tooth part that sticks up, needs to be head height to provide full cover for the defenders on the wall. That's their whole point and purpose! And so because of that, this wall actually doesn't have any proper embattlements at all. It's just a wall, and that's it. And we can see this when people on the wall get shot by the Urakai down below. That's a big fail in the defensive design of this wall and fortress. So if you ever see a castle wall or anything with crenellations on them, and they are only coming up to waist or chest height, they're aesthetic battlements, they're not realistic or functional at all. The other thing about this wall is that there are no intermediate towers or parts on it that extend a bit outwards. By having areas on walls that extend a bit outwards, and that can be kind of an extension of the wall itself or a tower, it provides a platform for archers and defenders to shoot sideways down at attackers who are assailing the walls. Without any extensions like this, the defenders can only really attack those people that are directly in front and below them, and then angles to their sides, but nowhere near at 90 degree angles, and that is a defensive limitation. The main fortress part of the Hornburg is built into the side of the cliff itself. That can be both good and bad depending on the nature of the cliff. It means that the fortress only has to defend one main side, so it can't be attacked from behind. But it also means that things can fall on it from the cliff above, and if people can get access to the top part of the cliff, and were to engineer some type of landslide or something like that, well, the fortress would be pretty screwed. If this region gets snow, alright, and even if the fortress part of the Hornburg doesn't get snow, but the tops of the mountains do, and they're not too far away, well, then the risk of avalanche also exists. Alright, now let's look at the gate. The entrance to the Hornburg is raised up higher than ground level. That is a very proper and defensive feature. But then they do not have a drawbridge separating the gate from the ramp that people have to walk up to reach it. That is just ludicrous when it comes to medieval style defences. And renders the advantage of having that raised entrance completely pointless. Yes, they have to traverse a narrow ramp which kind of bottlenecks them and that's a good thing. But again, this is the the perfect setup to have a drawbridge and it's not there at all, which just seems to defy reason for me. The next odd thing about the gatehouse is that there's no secondary door either. Once they break through the first door, they're in! There should be a secondary door at the back end of the gatehouse to trap people inside and then you have the fun joy of using murder holes and arrow slits to destroy the enemy once they're in there. When looking at the Hornburg, there's a very big missed opportunity here. A river runs all the way in and down under the wall, which means they have free running water to it and they could have dug out the area in front of the deeping wall and made a really effective moat. One that ran along the entire length of the deeping wall and in front of the Hornburg main fortress and keep. But it's not there. Another massively big 
missed opportunity. Okay, so the Hornburg unfortunately isn't really coming up to scratch at the moment. There's been a lot of issues with it. There is one thing, okay, that I absolutely love, but... And there is a but, but I'll get there. But first, let me tell you why it's awesome. This is one of the most effective and awesome kind of designs you can have on a fortress. And that is having two main entrances that are off-center to one another. Look at what the enemy will have to do if they ever get through the first gate. Then the second gate isn't directly in front of them, and you need a battering ram or something to knock down the front door. And battering rams are usually long. But once you get through the first door, you need to make a hard left turn, 90 degree left turn angle. And if the battering ram is too long, it won't be able to fit around that corner. And then you'd go around in a loop to another door or another entrance. And this is a narrow corridor that would be an absolute death trap for anyone trying to traverse it because there are two walls on either side where the enemy should be able to just rain death de down upon the attackers. And in this situation, what should really happen on the first main outer wall is that there should be battlements on either side. At the the front side facing out and also on the inside because they're going to be shooting down at the enemies along that narrow corridor but again on the Hornburg there's no battlements on the inside face of this wall and then when the enemy reaches the second entrance this is where I come to the butt okay there should be another door here and better yet there should be another whole gatehouse and with a door another gatehouse here there would not be enough room for the battering ram to turn and face the door because it's too narrow and so breaking through this second door would be an absolute turd. But there's a major fail here. There's no door. It's just an archway. What? What is what is going on here? <laughs> this is a huge fail in this fortress's design. It's almost a massive win, okay? One of the biggest wins, and because you see this on historical castles. The two off-centered entry points I'm referring to when I say you see this on historical castles. This is the exact defensive style or design that you see on Balmaris Castle. The main outer gatehouse, sometimes called the Barbican, sits off-center to the second gatehouse. And so after they get through the first gatehouse, they have to make a hard right 90 degree turn to try and get in front of the second gatehouse. But then there's a wall right behind them, preventing them from lining up a battering ram. And that would make trying to break down the door of the second gatehouse the biggest turd. It would be impossible. And Balmaris Castle isn't the only castle that does this. There are other ones as well, but it's a great example to show. And so that's my analysis of the Hornburg. And it's interesting because from a, you know, distant kind of, you know, perspective or look, just a cursory, you know, overview, it looks pretty strong and defensible. But when you go in close and, you know, analyze every single little thing, well, unfortunately, the Hornburg is a terribly designed fortress. And we are done. This has been my analysis of the cities and or castle-like structures in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, specifically Edoras, Minas Tirith, and the Hornburg of Helm's Deep. Thank you very much for watching. If you are interested in learning more about castles, please do go check out my other videos that are about castles. And until next time, farewell. If you would like to support Shadowversity or express appreciation for a video that you particularly enjoyed, please become a patron through Patreon. Your $1 donation would be absolutely wonderful.